Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to Exploring the Lord of the Rings. This is session number 296. And today we are going to, well, not exactly finish uh, the scene in front of the door, but we should at least finish the part where Gandalf is doing it wrong. Um, and perhaps even get so far as uh, the bad idea of throwing rocks into the pool. Um, so our attention may shift from the door to the pool. Uh, uh, later this evening. So we'll see how we go. And in fact, uh, it, I'm late starting up due to a series of issues. So I'm going to jump. We're just going to jump straight to the text. No announcements tonight. Straight to the text. So last night we were last night, last time, you know, last night in the world of the class, we were um, <clears throat> looking at this passage. Let me read the whole passage again. And then we'll focus on the latter part. He stepped up to the rock again and lightly touched with his staff the silver star in the middle beneath the, si the sign of the anvil. Anon Evelin, Edro Hiamen, Fenos Nogothrim, Lasto Bethlamen, he said in a commanding voice. The silver lines faded, but the blank gray stone did not stir. Many times he repeated these words in different order or varied them. Then he tried other spells, one after another, speaking now faster and louder, now soft and slow. Then he spoke many single words of elvish speech. Nothing happened. The cliff towered into the night. The countless stars were kindled. The wind blew cold, and the doors stood fast. Again Gandalf approached the wall, and lifting up his arms, he spoke in tones of command and rising wrath. Edro, Edro, he cried, and struck the rock with his staff. Open, open, he shouted, and followed it with the same command in every language that had ever been spoken in the west of Middle-earth. Then he threw his staff on the ground and sat down in silence. Okay, um, now, first of all, I was like deliberately skipping over this because this sentence because we were near the very end of class last time and I wanted to stay focused on the discussion we were having about Gandalf's verse and um, how he was attempting to open the door and such last time. But I want to make sure not to skip over that last sentence of the middle paragraph there. It is a gorgeous sentence. The cliff towered into the night. The countless stars were kindled. The wind blew cold and the doors stood fast. Isn't that a really, really good sentence? So he, um, the, the, the sort of the parallelism, right? He describes things happening, right? Um, it's like on the one hand, he's describing changes that are happening around them, right? The cliff towered into the night. Well, it wasn't fully night before. Right, so we can see that that's our first cue that time has passed. The countless stars were kindled. Um, <clears throat> that, of course, is the thing that's happening. The stars are coming out. The wind blew cold, which has been kind of doing, and the doors stood fast. Um, the fun thing about this to me is that he's using the active voice, right? So he just said, nothing happened. And then, as Eric was suggesting, he then throws that out there um, <clears throat> and then he like describes in the active voice things happening but almost everything that's happening is a description of nothing right yeah Eric as you say it's they're not exact they're not they're active verbs but they're not actions they're they're acts of being right the cliff towered uh, the stars were kindled. That one is the one that's not in the active, right? That one's in the passive voice. <clears throat> and ironically, it's the only change <laughs> that's happening. The cliff, the cliff is still towering, the wind is still blowing, and the doors are still standing fast, right? Um, <laughs> yeah, as Bjorning says, nothing happened so hard. Yes, yes, exactly. Um, Anyway, so it's, um, I, I just, I think that that's, 
the it's such a it's such an elegant way for him to describe the passage of time with everybody now like after you know Gandalf you know ripped Boromir a new one and threatened to bash Pippin's head against the cliff and everyone's I, I, everyone's shutting up now right um and yet the time is passing and the anxiety increases. Yes, Corey, I, I saw that before. The, the ice muttered in the mouths of the sea. Uh, it was that it was, uh, this sentence was reminding you of the Finrod poem. Yes. Um, yes, it does. It does sound like that. Um, yes. Um, and Jackie, I agree The the short clauses do kind of build this tension, right? It's like you, you wouldn't, we wouldn't normally be thinking about the cliff and looking at the stars and thinking about the wind, right? Um, if not for the fact that, like, nothing is happening and, and just that experience of, like, we're looking around and, 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 and anyway, yeah, the, the way that it, that it builds the tension, I think, is, um, uh, is, is just, is really fun. And, um, Yes, as uh, Jackie, I think you were suggesting before, um, <clears throat> there is some fun alliteration going on here, too. Notice how the first three, um, the first three, so we got the four little, like, parallel clauses there, right, in that sentence, and the first three of them are brought to you by the k sound, right? The cliff towered into the night. The countless stars were kindled. The wind blew cold. We start the first one with with the 1K sound. We have 2K sounds in the second one. And we end the third one with a K sound. So it's like completely symmetrical, uh, the K sounds in those first three clauses. And then, and the doors stood fast. Um, we didn't have any uh, initial Ds or any initial Fs in the, um, um, uh, in the, in the, in the earlier part of the sentence. Um, exactly, exactly. The opening, uh, the opening three clauses brought to you by the K sound there. Um, and yes, Bjorning, we do have, it is also a gentle reminder that as night is approaching and the wolves will be returning, um, this is, an increasingly dangerous situation, right? And we see, we see Gandalf responding to that. His whole initial approach has failed. His plan A, his plan B, his plan C have all failed. He knows they really need this, that, you know, he was always on a time limit. That time limit is getting shorter and shorter, right? Again, Gandalf approached the wall, and lifting up his arms, he spoke in tones of command and rising wrath. Gandalf is angry. Angry angry at himself for not figuring it out. Angry at the door. And notice his approach here. <clears throat> this seems clearly to be... Yeah, rising wrath is a wonderful phrase, Jackie. I love the alliteration of that. Rising wrath. Tones of command and rising wrath. Um, uh, yes, uh, his, his, uh, his wrath is rising like the cliff towers, Dr. Benway. It's, uh, uh, his wrath by the end of this is going to be towering into the night, indeed. Yes, yes. Um, Notice what his, um, um, notice what his approach is here. He's just yelling at the doors. I mean, there's just, there's desperation here. Open, open. He's calling at them in every language he can think of. On the one hand, this seems, it seems like Gandalf has given up trying to guess a password or trying to hit on the right opening spell. Those were seemed to be his, what plan A was his kind of his password spell, right? 
his spell to open the, to, to get the doors to respond to him and to open. That didn't work. He then, plan B was to alter it, right? Maybe that was, make and tweak it, right? I can tweak it and make it work. And that didn't work. Plan C was to speak many other single words of Elvish speech, which sounds like sort of passwords or keywords in some way that might possibly, um, that might possibly work here, right? He now seems to be utterly abandoning either spells, that is the use of his own magical power, or guessing passwords, trying to get inside the heads of the elves and dwarves who made it. Or, uh, well, no, I was going to say, or to speak to the doors directly as he was in the spell, but no, he is speaking to the doors directly, right? Um, and he's just, he's just commanding them to open. On what? His own authority? When he does this, in every language that had ever been spoken in the west of Middle-earth, I can't believe that he's doing that because he thinks he's going to hit on it. Like, that, because he's as if he were still searching for a password, right? I mean, I don't think that Gandalf has made the, like the rational conclusion that the best way to go about this is going to be a more like longitudinal or algorithmic approach, right, to um, uh, to finding the keyword. I don't think that he really believes that, like, actually, yeah, what, what has to happen, Gandalf, is you have to say the word open in, like, the dialect that was used by the hillmen of Angmar, um, you know, in the first millennium, if you do that, right, uh, you know, the dialect that they used before the Witch King came to Angmar. So if you say the word open in that dialect, then yeah, no, it's, it'll, that'll totally work, right? Again, I, I don't think he has any, um, <laughs> any real umdeer that that's going to happen. This seems to be almost entirely an expression of frustration on his part. He is commanding them to open. And it's almost like the the language thing. Um, yes, pre-Proto-Indo-Angmarian. Exactly, Eric. That would be the language. Um, uh, he... It's almost like... I'm trying to figure out, like, Apart from mere, like, irritation, right? Irritation and the desire to be seen to be doing something, right? Um, but again, it's... What he's doing is not password guessing. Because, um, again, certainly... There is at least a limited number of languages that you would have to choose, even if you were going to take a more, you know, longitudinal approach uh, to trying to guess the password, Right? Um, again, surely there are a large percentage of the languages that have ever been spoken in the West of Middle-earth that you could rule out, <laughs> right, as uh, being what the password was, was, was in. Um, but, um, so yeah, I don't think that he's, I don't, I don't think that that's what's happening here. I think he, and, because again, what he's doing is he's expressing a command. He is telling it what it wants them, what he wants to do. From the beginning to the end, that is from the very first thing he does to the very last thing that he does here, he seems to believe that what has to happen is that he has to communicate with the gate. The gate has to listen to him. He has to ask the gate to tell the gate to open to him. I mean, at the end of the day, he's not doing anything different in the end here than he was doing in the spell. The spell was just fancier, right? Doors of the elves opened unto me. That's what he says, right? And now he's just saying, open, open, <laughs> right? It's the same, it's the same approach. Um, uh, yes, Johnny, I think that's exactly it. Um, 
It's a battle of wills, not of words. Yes. And Charles, as you said, he's exerting his will. Um, whereas the password guessing, password guessing is playing by someone else's rules. Yes. Yes. I, I think that it, he, it seems so he, he believes I have to connect with the gates. I have to get them to respond to me. Um, and again, it's I, the, I think that his shouting at it in other languages is not just a way for him to vent his feelings, which I think is part of what's going on there, given that he's actually beating on it with his staff at this point, right? Um, so part of it is venting his feelings, but part of it, it sounds like, uh, what, that it's, um, it's like he's trying to pull rank, right? Like, I, I'm going to ask you to open in every language that there is, thus proving, right, that this is not a random request. This is not, it's, 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 oh, you should listen to me. I'm someone you should listen to, right? It is as if all of the free peoples of Middle-earth are begging you to open, okay? Can we, can we do that, please? Um, yeah, it is almost like a way, Johnny, of saying Gandalf is here. Yes, yes. Um, and Miss Ray, you're right. The door immediately shut him down by the, by with the lines fading, but he keeps trying the same thing over and over. Yes, yes, um, exactly. The, the language is thick. It's it is almost like I think he's saying, "Do you know who I am?" Right. But I, again, I think that the thing that we see, you know, we don't know exactly what are the single words of Elvish speak of Elvish speech that he's using. My guess is that maybe they're like. Maybe he's not password guessing there. Maybe those are words of command. Maybe those are opening spells. Um, um, again, we'll, I know it's hard not to talk about the closing spells and stuff that he's going to, that he's going to work on later on. But, um, uh, but in any case, he just said that he knew 200 spells of opening and it seems likely that he's working through and thinking of, uh, the number of those spells that he knows in Elvish, right? And that many of those are presumably um, uh, single words there. Um, because it seems from, the, from his first attempt through to his final attempts, what he is doing is still the same. Addressing the door, marshalling his own will and trying to get the gates to respond, to respect his will. Um, yeah. You know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of, um, this will be like dating myself, but I think there are some of you who will relate to it. It reminds me of the old uh, text-based video games like Zork. If you ever played those sorts of games where you had to like to do the thing, you had to choose the exact word, right? And like you knew what had to happen, you knew what you needed to do, but if you didn't think of the exact right word that they had thought of and programmed in for you to say, and and you just like start like throwing synonyms that even that you know or can't possibly be the right ones. <laughs> um Anyway, yeah, like, I, I get it. I understand. I understand the frustration. Um, and again, one of the things that um, uh, that leads to those, um, that kind of frustration is that feeling of, like, I know what needs to happen. Like, I know that I am right. <laughs> right? I know that I'm right. Why can't, why won't this thing listen to me? Right? Um uh, yes, you cannot get you flask. That's exactly it, Valori. I love that. I love that uh, that sketch. Um, uh, yes, exactly. So it's that seems to be uh, something like the kind of experience that Gandalf is having here. But again, the problem is he believes big picture. He knows what the solution is, right? And that seems clear. That seems a very clear trend um, from top to bottom here. So 
the thing, I think, that he's not... So if, if we had to try to characterize, what is the mistake that Gandalf makes? Where does Gandalf go wrong in his approach to this? I think that the thing that he doesn't get is the entire concept that it's a riddle. It's the playfulness of it that he doesn't get. Um, yeah, he's, he's, he's overthinking it. Um, uh, the mechanism for opening the doors is, a, is, in a sense, a totally different kind of mechanism than what he expects. And you know what I wonder? Yeah, uh, April, you're right. Um, the solution is much more tra la 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 than Gandalf thinks. <laughs> that's exactly, that's exactly right. Um, uh, yeah, and that's interesting, Matt. Matt says he's exerting his will against a door that is designed to resist someone exerting their will. The door wants to be invited open rather than have a demand placed on it. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and Bob, you are certainly correct that it is very understandable. It's, it's I think we'd all have a little bit of a hard time getting yourself into a tra la la lolly frame of mind you know, under these circumstances, when you've got this kind of a time limit and there are murderous wolves in pursuit. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, but yes, it does seem that the door is resistant to domination. And I wonder... Let me see if I can formulate this question properly. I wonder if this suggests that the door is easier to get through than Gandalf thinks, or harder. Let me explain what I mean. On the one hand, it's easier, clearly, right? Like, he's trying to exert his will. He's trying to make it acknowledge his will and respond to his will. Open unto me. Um, but he is... Um, but it, 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 he doesn't actually need to do that. The door doesn't want him to do that. The door won't listen if he does that. Instead, he just has to say the word that's right there on the arch. He just has to answer the little riddle, right? He just has to say the word friend. On the one hand, that makes it seem like it's way easier to get into this door than you might think, right? But on the other hand, if the door is designed to be resistant to will, if it won't respond um, to, someone command, to someone who commands it to open... Um, it, does that make it more or less likely that it could be tricked? Again, that like if Sauron walked up to it and said Melon, it would open to him cheerfully, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, Count Elros, that's one of the things that I still don't think I fully understand. And that is, would the door have opened if Gandalf had actually read it out in Sindarin? instead of Westron. Because if he if instead of translating the inscription he just read it. Um so that the riddle is like um um uh uh yeah, yeah, I don't know. Um Right, and Josh, I agree that if the door requires a tra la 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 mindset, then Sauron could never get in. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I wonder, is it... Would it open accidentally? Was it really designed to be low security? That's one possibility. I mean, given that the password is there on the arch the whole time. Right. Um, that would suggest high, I mean, by itself, that would seem to suggest that high security, not the primary, um, the, the primary plan. But, um, but yeah, Bjorning, that's what I'm kind of thinking too, 
Um, I suspect the door only opens when a person says Melon actually as a friend. Um, yeah. Yeah, that there is will involved, but the will is not. Um, if you're exerting your will, saying any version of don't you know who I am, right? Open because it's me. Open because I tell you to. It's never going to work. Um, but if you can, uh, if you are sufficiently friendly to deliver the friend password in the right frame of mind, um, uh, if it, it is a test of will, but it's about how your will is set. It's not about exerting. It's exactly not about exerting your will over the door. Um, and because I think we'll see, Ganov doesn't just figure out the password. He's laughing when he delivers it. Um, so whether or not a tra la 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 attitude is in fact required or not, um, Gandalf is going to have it. He's going to recover it when he actually opens the door, right? But when he throws his staff on the ground and sits down in silence, he is assuredly not in a uh, tra la la frame of mind here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> from Pujam says, if I knocked Pippin and Boromir's heads against the door, maybe it would work. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, right, Bjorning says, uh, is hobbitry the necessary ingredient? Um, in a sense, right? I mean, not hobbitry in the sense of like... Um, you know, lightheartedly insulting your friends necessarily. But yes, the kind of combination of both friendship and lightheartedness that does mark Hobbit interactions is certainly the sort of thing, right, um, that, uh, that, he's, uh, that he's working on here. Or at least that he should, he should be working on here. But let's, uh, let's go on. We'll get back to Gandalf's success here in the end. Um, I mainly wanted to make sure that we kind of close the loop on uh, on Gandalf's process there. Um, I, by the way, let me and let me say this just before we go on. I know that we have not, we didn't fully complete the discussion of the concept of spells, um, and spells as magic, spells as a subset of magic, and what that is and how that works exactly. Um, I know we're gonna we will come back to that, and before too long. Um, we will certainly talk about it more when we do get to the Chamber of Mazarbo, um, because it's going to come up again there. This stretch from the gates of, you know, from the doors of Durin through the Bridge of Khazad Doom is one of the, like, defining stretches for the use of magic in the water. It's one, well, no, I'm going to say defining, let me say peculiar stretches um, in the use of magic in The Lord of the Rings. And so, to some extent, I kind of want to delay, um, you know, drawing conclusions until we see more of those, um, of that, of that, um, uh, those usages, the, the ways that Tolkien talks about it during this stretch. So, um, so I wanted to make sure we noted it, so I just, I want to acknowledge that I'm not just forgetting and leaving it behind. We're deliberately kind of putting a pin in it and we'll come back to it uh, before too very long in the context of exploring the Lord of the Rings. At least this isn't something we have to wait to the return of the king for in any case. Um, okay. At that moment, from far off, the wind bore to their listening ears the howling of wolves. Bill the Pony started in fear, and Sam sprang to his side and whispered softly to him. Do not let him run away, said Boromir. It seems that we shall need him still, if the wolves do not find us. How I hate this foul pool! He stooped, and picking up a large stone, he cast it far into the dark water. The stone vanished with a soft slap, but at the same instant there was a swish and a bubble. Great rippling rings formed on the surface out beyond where the stone had fallen and they moved slowly towards the foot of the cliff. 
Why did you do that, Boromir? said Frodo. I hate this place too, and I am afraid. I do not know of what. Not of wolves, or the dark behind the doors, but of something else. I am afraid of the pool. Don't disturb it. I wish we could get away, said Merry. Why doesn't Gandalf do something quick, said Pippin. Um, okay. Um, Boromir's action here is to me extremely revealing. Um, I was suggesting before when Boromir uh, lost his grip on his diplomacy that the, seer, the big problem he is having is with the pool. Um, the way that he was looking at it suggested that that was creeping him out and bothering him more than anything else was. Um, he was, like, resolved. The wolves? Remember, he was the one who was like, we're probably going to get trapped between the wolves of the wall and sell our lives dearly, surrounded by snarling wolves. He was prepared for that, right? And in a manner of speaking, that's the sort of thing Boromir is always prepared for, right? Valiant death in battle, surrounded by innumerable enemies and while we sell our lives dearly and take as many foes with us as possible. He's been trained for that, right? That's part of his everyday reality, in a sense. As a soldier, as a, uh, you know, as, as, as a warrior, someone of, uh, um, you know, who's, who's read the books that Boromir has, right? Someone of his, uh, of his, of his training, right? Um, but this, this is outside of his experience, right? Why does Boromir throw a rock into the pool? Frodo asks him that question. Why did you do that, Boromir? Um, knock it off, right? Why did you do that? Um, Boromir never answers that, right? Yeah, Am Ambrosius, I agree. At first blush, it does feel childishness, childish. And um, JJ, I agree with you completely. And Bjorning, that's exactly what I was thinking. Boromir, Boromir is a man of action, right? He can't take it anymore. He how I hate this foul pool. And he picks up a rock and throws the rock out into the pool. Now, um, this, I think, is not just the perfectly natural impulse to throw rocks into a body of water. Um, I've noticed that some people cannot understand the almost irresistible impulse to throw rocks into a body of water. Um, and to some people, it's perfectly natural. Um, but I certainly do not believe that that's what's happening here. Um, he is... There is nothing he can... Do. So there are like, two things here. There is nothing that he can do. Now, notice, Boromir has here done two things. He has taken refuge in two separate actions, which, both of which, I think, are, um, have the effect of relieving some of his pent-up frustration, right? Um, one is throwing the rock at the pool. The other is issuing a command. Do not let him run away. Boromir's never talked like that. Boromir has studiously avoided ever talking like that. Boromir does not have the standing to give commands to anybody in this group. Boromir knows it would be something this close to mutiny for him to step in and give commands like this, right? But he's done it. He's done it. He's not... Um, 
he is taking charge of the situation. He seems to take Gandalf sitting down and seeming to give up on getting through the door as a silent confession on Gandalf's part that he can't get the door open. Which means, in turn, his whole thing, um, his whole thing is not where is. He's come to a dead end. So. I, some people are wondering whether the ring is influencing Boromir. I do not say I believe that to be impossible. But I think I would say I see no evidence of it. No clear evidence of it anyway. I don't think that Boromir is acting out of character at all. Um... He is acting exactly in character. It was like his previous, like his previous statements, acting in character with his filters down, right? Um, now it's it's not normal for him to have his filters down. He's very diplomatic um, and experienced with this kind of thing. But under extreme circumstances, he's going to act. Um, He's going to act without, um, you know, without with fewer filters when he's under certain kinds of pressure, right? And I think that there are two pressures that we see here. One, first, is frustration. With the, he has gone out of his way, so far out of his way, to respect the leadership of Gandalf and of Aragorn. He's been so good, so many times, and we've seen it so many times, how good he's been. He has started to get out of that, right? He has started to, that has started to, crumble a little bit, most notably in his last speech, right? Um, though, again, even there, I don't think he's being actively rude, just undiplomatic in asking the question, again, without asking the question without filters. Um, the reason I say I don't see any evidence of the ring's activity here is... We know that there are a couple things. We know there are some things that the ring creates in people. But what we know that the ring creates in people is desire to possess it, admiration for it, the ring, admiration for the ring, desire to possess the ring. And then we see a couple things once someone does possess it. Desire to, like, justify its possession, right? To um, render one's claim on it greater. We see um, uh, an impulse to separate oneself from other people and to be alone with the ring. We saw that very clearly in Gollum. We see it very clearly in Frodo as well. We see it in, in Bilbo as well with his confounded visitors hanging on the bell and that sort of thing. Um, those are, um, those are the things that we know. Those are the feelings that we know, um, the ring can create. I don't see any evidence that any of this is related to any of those things. I don't think that we have any evidence to believe that the ring is just going to make people more likely to act like a jerk. Um, so, so yeah, I don't think so. Um, I don't think so. Even his, even the potential sort of rivalry in leadership with Gandalf here 
is not about you guys are still talking about the pool hang on we'll get back to the pool one thing at a time one thing at a time trying to be orderly here um can't go jumping around too much here again there are two things happening here with Boromir and I'm trying to do them in order we'll get to the pool in just a second um uh anyway he the tension the leadership tension between Boromir and Gandalf far from something that the ring that we could assume the ring would be placing in his mind that's totally normal for Boromir Boromir is like he's the leader for him to be a subordinate is weird like it's it's very un <laughs> if if i could say even just personally from my own experience um i've been i've been the president of a an institution for 12 years now and there have been a couple of occasions in which i have in other circumstances been in a subordinate position like been not in charge like i've been participating in a group of which i am not in charge right and in an organization where i am not the boss and i can tell you it's hard to stand on your tongue like you get used to you get used to certain dynamics right um and it's it's hard again it's not like it's not like an ego thing it's not like a, oh you don't know what you're doing and it's just it's how you're used to operating right like it's it's hard to remember like oh wait hang on right no i'm not I'm not in charge. <laughs> I'm not in charge. Let me not. Let me not. Not. not I, I, I'll make a suggestion, but I have to make sure to keep, you know, make sure to say it as it. I mean, he is, and yeah, Druid's fire. Just as you say, he's not just used to being a leader. He's used to being a a general. He's used, he's a soldier. He is used to giving commands. He's used to being in command. So, the way he's been standing on his tongue the kind of diplomacy he has been showing is very it's it's a strain for him right um and so again even here do not let him run away this isn't boromir being a jerk right this is boromir he submitted to gandalf several times, right? Um, and Gandalf just kind of yelled at him and he's like, okay. So notice, he doesn't, he could be a jerk here, right? I mean, Boromir could, there's so much Boromir could say right here. Boromir could be like, so, now that the wizard's foolish plan has come to nothing, you know, it's time for us to, like, try to salvage something out of this mess, right? I mean, that's absolutely what it looks like right now. And he doesn't say that. He doesn't do that. What Gandalf is still thinking, right? So all he's doing is saying, like, okay, let's... I'm going to take charge of this situation. Don't let him run away. It seems that we shall need him still if the wolves do not find us, right? We've got to do something. This is what needs to happen, right? Um, and then at the same time, he then turns in what feels within the context of this speech like a non sequitur. He then turns and says, how I hate this foul pool. The one thing he actually expresses agitation about. Right. Yeah, Charles, I think you're right. Um, he sees Gandalf powerless for a moment, and that could really amplify his own feelings of being powerless here. Yes. Yes. Aranas, I agree. To some extent, the pool is a safe target for his anger. I do think he's taking out his frustrations on the pool. Right? But I think that that choice of target is revealing in a couple different ways. On the one hand, it reveals that Boromir is not totally out of control. If Boromir were totally out of control, he'd be lashing out at everybody. Especially Gandalf. Right? I mean, Gandalf just yelled at him. And um, 
he could totally give it back to Gandalf right now. So, having allowed you more than a little bit of time free from foolish questions, what have you accomplished? Nothing. All right, fine. I'm taking over, right? Like, he, he could absolutely, he could absolutely do that. But he doesn't do that. Um, instead, he vents his feelings, just as Gandalf vented his feelings by beating his staff on the, on the wall. Boromir vents his feelings by throwing the stone at the water. But the other thing that it shows us about Boromir, the other thing that is revealing about this action is how much the pool bothers him. It's a, a strange... Like, of all the things that are happening here, um, the pool of water that they're standing next to which is admittedly disgusting. I mean, it's like stagnant and greasy and gross. But surely it seems like the least threat, right? The least threatening bit of everything, right? I mean, notice when Frodo addresses it, I am afraid, he says, I don't know of what, not of wolves, Obvious danger number one. Or of the dark behind the doors, obvious danger number two. I mean, that's part of the discomfort of this whole situation, right? If we don't get these doors open, we're going to get at by wolves. If we do get these doors open, goodness knows what's going to eat us inside there, right? I mean, we're entering into this hideously dangerous place um, that we have lots of reason to think might kill us, right? Um... So there's plenty of things to be afraid of. And Frodo goes through both of those two obvious things and says, no, no, it's actually the thing that's bugging me is neither one of those things. I'm afraid of the pool. And Boromir clearly has the same impulse, the same feeling. It is getting to him. It has been getting to him. I believe, as I said before, that's the thing that made Boromir lose his cool. Like, that's what broke Boromir. I do think that the th throwing a stone, the rock throwing business, is the frustrated expression of a man of action who has no action to take. Right? Um, Eric, that's a really good question. Did Gandalf and the others not feel the same way about the pool, or was Gandalf simply trying not to draw attention to it? Um, I, I, I can't imagine that Gandalf was oblivious, right? Gandalf's attention is just focused elsewhere. And I think, I mean, I see no reason to believe that Gandalf and Aragorn both weren't just trying to get them in and through the doors before anything could happen, right? Um, which, notice, would have happened, right? If the doors had opened when Gandalf had said his really quite lovely little couplet, um, they're good, I think. They're good. Now, I saw the question earlier on, does the Watcher... Would the Watcher have attacked them if Boromir hadn't thrown the stone? Um, I think that that's a, an interesting... I guess it's, it's hard to say. Do I believe the Watcher was asleep and only waked up by... Boromir's stone? No. I don't think that's the case. Um, I don't think that's the case because we did hear a splash in the water that sounded like a fish jumping, but probably wasn't a fish jumping. Um, and they already walked through the water. They already disturbed it. They waded through it. I think the Watcher's aware of them. I think that surely is true. But it does seem that had they walked right up to the gate, 
Gandalf had laughed and said Melon at the very beginning and the doors had opened and they'd walked in, does the Watcher attack? Maybe, maybe not. Um, yeah, Johnny says the stone was an act of war. Um, yeah, kind of. Boromir is, it is as, um, uh, as someone was just saying before, um, it was an act of defiance, right? In a way, Boromir is constructively venting his frustration, right? He's a soldier. He's not only a man of action, he's a soldier, right? This, like, really spooky lake, not in his experience, right? Um... There is no military formation. There is no, you know, action with sword or shield that he can do to have any impact on a lake, on an evil lake, right? Um, that he seems not only afraid of it, but bothered by the fact that he's afraid of it seems clear. Um, that he... Um, wants to I don't know what it's almost like an act of empowerment like he's trying to he feels disempowered he feels helpless because he's afraid of the he doesn't know what he's afraid of why he's afraid of it or what he can possibly do against the thing that he's afraid of right so taking some violent action against the thing gives him some kind of a um, a sense of empowerment, right? Um, but I do suspect that the Watcher picks up on this. It is a kind of challenge. It is an attack. Um, what is the Watcher thinking? Well, we'll come back to that question. We're going to get um, a sort of clue about that. Um, let me um, let me say um, I can make it. I can I can uh, be no plainer than to say um, that we will uh, talk about the motivations of the Watcher soon, um, but. Um, well, well, there's I think there's uh, for that reason, let's let's collect all our data on this. Let's wait till the attack um, before we draw further conclusions about this. Um, but no, I don't think that the rock disturbed him from sleep. He seems to have already been disturbed. It's clear that he doesn't just attack immediately in response to the rock or else he'd already be attacking. Right. Um uh, but let's watch let's watch what happens here um, yeah um, yes the last thing that I would point out in connection with this though first Frodo and then Mary Frodo Frodo has some insight here. Frodo's insight is that there is something to be afraid of in the pool. That something bad could actually happen if you disturb the pool. Don't disturb it. Right? I hate this place too, and I am afraid. Notice how he separates those two things. Right? I also have a scared and creepy feeling standing next to this lake. And you know what? I, Frodo, am not dismissing this as an irrational and shameful feeling on my part. I'm not just spooked. I'm, there is something I perceive that there is something to be afraid of here. I don't know what. But there is something else here. 
I am afraid of the pool. Don't disturb it. And Mary's contribution. I wish we could get away. Get away from here, from the edge of the pool. Escape the pool. Not the wolves. No one's thinking of the wolves. The wolves just howled again. We just got a reminder of the wolves. And that's kind of the interesting transition, right? We just heard the howling of wolves. The danger they've been racing against all day long, right? Um, if they get caught out in the open country at night again, it's going to be really, really tough, right? But now the evidence that they, the wolves are closing in now, the stars have come out, they're hearing the wolves, the clock is ticking. None of them are, I seem to be talking about that, right? Um... Yeah, Bjarne Sonner, it is a really interesting, um, almost nightmare feeling scenario, isn't it? Um, Bjarne Sonner says, it seems like it'd be very easy to escape the pool, right? It's not like the lake's going to chase you. Um, and yet it feels nearly impossible, right? Like, I wish we could get away. Yes, yes. Um, I think that Bill is responding to the wolves. He's the one who's responding to the wolves. Um I don't know that Bill is responding to the pool. But yes, this sense of being the sense of being trapped. Yes. Yes. Um Yeah. Um I also am not at all sure. Some of you have been mentioning to the um comparative paucity of stories about monsters like this lurking in lakes especially freshwater lakes like maybe there would like sea monsters and sea serpents and stuff there's there's lots of stories about monsters at sea right um that there are scary monsters out in the deeps um there are many very old legends about that right in many societies so um uh, that's easy enough to find. But as far as lake monsters and things, that's a little harder. It's a little unusual, right? Um, so, yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Uh, we'll end with a trivia question. Where in the book so far, what other freshwater creature who snatches and kills things that wander by the body of water have we met already? <laughs> Goldberry. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. We've met one. We've met one. Yeah, Rowan, with Old Man Willow, we had a similar kind of experience. That was a pushing in rather than a pulling in, right? Um, but I, I have to wonder if Mary is not remembering the old man Willow experience there. Um, but um, uh, yeah, the boat that got Frodo's parents, yes. Boating is very dangerous under any circumstances. Um, but, um, what, yeah, you know, so, well, Gollum kind of, Gollum kind of, um, he was associated with a lake, and did eat things alive. So Gollum's Lake was a creepy lake in some ways. Um, but, um, uh, yeah, yeah. But uh, um, I mentioned Goldberry, not because within the text of the Lord of the, of the you know, Fellowship of the Ring, there is any evidence that Goldberry ever snatched any wandering uh, person and attempted to drown them in the water, um, whether or not. You know, that's how, um, whether or not you like Goldberry's manner of getting husbands, um, I, I bring her up because in English folklore, that is actually the dominant creepy lake and or river, um, folktale, basically, that there's a fairy spirit usually female, um, Jenny Greenteeth, um, 
for instance, is a very popular one. There are other famous river spirits who like to snatch especially children uh, and pull them into the water and drown them. Um, so he's already, Tolkien has already kind of embodied that one particular uh, very common English tradition. Um, so yes, yes, there is in fact a tradition of strange women lying in ponds, though they don't normally distribute swords. They are more likely to try to drown you. Um, so yes, that's a thing, but what we're going to get, what we are on the verge of getting here is something quite different. And the feeling that this lake has um, the kinds of bodies of water in which spirits like Goldberry or Jenny Greenteeth or whoever um, uh, tend to are not like creepy, stagnant, greasy lakes like this. They're usually nice, fresh flowing. Um, uh, rivers um, and things. But anyway, water with, li with, with water lilies. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Um, yes. Um, so, yes. Anyway, this is all to say what kind of context. I'm, the, the, the thing that I'm getting at is... I mean, we, we don't know, but like what kind of context might they have? Because nobody seems to know. Boromir, the rock throwing again, suggests a frustrated ignorance, right? He doesn't know, and he hates not knowing. Frodo has a specific fear. He doesn't know of what. Like, he doesn't have a concrete idea. He just says, I'm afraid of the pool. Don't disturb it as if something, dis as if, if disturbed, it would do something. Right. Um, when Pippin says, why doesn't Gandalf do something quick? Um, this is, of course, not only an extremely frustrating suggestion for a leader to receive, but also, I think the ambiguity of it is important, right? Opening the door is only one issue that is going on, right? Um, and I wonder if Pippin isn't thinking, why doesn't Gandalf do something about the pool? Um, if Pippin... Mary seems to share Frodo's feeling, and what he seems to want to get away from, I think, is the pool. If Pippin also shares Mary and Frodo's feelings about this place and the pool, I think that perhaps if Gandalf has been doing the let's not worry about the pool, let's get through the doors and just leave it behind and, you know, hope we can leave without incident. Um, if that's Gandalf's approach, I think Pippin is here signaling it's maybe time to think about it. Right. Um, yeah, yeah. So I don't know, Bjorning, if Pippin has more insight into the existence of evil in the pool than Merry and Frodo do. I think, but I think he might share their general their general feelings. Um, Vardendil, exactly. Gandalf did drive the wolves away last night. Right. So yes, he, he can cleanse the water, open the door, drive the wolves away again, um, enable the party to skip lightly over the mountains, something, anything, right? Um, yeah, he's already, he's already done one of those things and failed at the other. That is allowing them to pass over the mountains. He failed at that, right? Um, but um, yeah, yeah. Uh, and yes, we're not going to talk about this yet because we haven't gotten to the latter scene yet. But I saw the questions about Pippin's stone and Boromir's stone, the comparison and, contra and contrasting between Pippin's stone and uh, and um, and 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 Boromir's stone. I think, I believe, they're much more different than they are similar. But um, 
Uh, but we'll get there. We'll get there. Um, all right. I We pretty much got through this slide, so there we go. Not bad. Uh, got through one plus, 1.3 maybe slides here today. Um, so... Um, yeah, so we will see. Uh, we will see what happens next. Uh, next time, I should be here again next week. I think I'm. 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 I'm still on a little run here now, um, uh, through I believe the rest of March. So, I will look forward to seeing you guys again next week. Um, in the meantime, it's field trip time. Back to Mario, as we are slightly ahead of uh, the company here. We almost got to the coat rack. Almost. Not quite. <laughs> I just love this bit with like Boromir declaring war on the pond like Caligula in the ocean. <laughs> yeah, it's it's not quite, it's a little bit less crazy than, yeah, than Caligula. But, uh, but yeah. He's definitely channeling that, you know, must declare war on the sea. But you, you do bring up an interesting point. I mean, um, I'm going to be like uh, pedantic here and, and point out that Jenny Greenteeth is a nursery bogey. And, you know, like, like that and some of the other water creatures, they're meant, they're just fairy stories told to children to keep them away from deep places. But we of do course. seem to keep coming up with this, uh, with, with, with this theme of dangerous waters that's a that's a theme we do keep it i wonder as a child who liked to run around in the wilderness a lot wonder how many of these monsters he and his brother had been threatened with by various caretakers yeah to stay yeah. away well, from I mean, of course i mean I, I, um i don't think myself that um the use of a folk story like a nursery bogey like that the application of it as nursery mm -hmm. bogey to scare um i don't think necessarily like we still get stories about Jenny Greenteeth like there is still I suppose a, but I think there, I think there we know the psychological a, damage though. well sure yeah yeah no there's no question it does psychological damage but, but the point is simply like there is still a, a sort of mythic concept right uh, um, yeah yeah uh, that, I've told children basically how to appease house fairies and stuff is you know at Christmas time we make porridge for the Nyssa Sure, sure. Yep. No, there's all kinds of uh, uh, things. I mean, many Santa Claus rituals and things like that um, are sort of connected in the same sort of way. But um, but it, but it is. I mean, although yes, it is certainly true that that is the way that um, those stories, the like, don't play next to the river because you might drown stories, um, are applied. Uh, I, again, I that it doesn't change the fact that there is still a large body of folk tales uh, uh, in this. Like it's a, and that's why I think Tolkien like avails himself of it, right? I mean, he backed mm -hmm. off from it. We don't get that story about again. We we wouldn't know that about Goldberry if we had nothing but the Lord of the Rings. Um, yes, but um, but it's still like that's where she came from. Like that's the that's the. Oh yeah, no, that was that was my middle kid's favorite story. Yeah, I had to tell stories about Tom Bombadil and Goldberry and Farmer Maggot. Yes, yes. Um, but yeah, in her defense, though, I don't know if she knows how lungs work. <laughs> right, right. Okay, so um, so hang on, we were gonna go, we were gonna go back up to our um. Yep. To the landing. Back up to the landing here. Yes. Oh, that's right. We we're gonna look at the swimming pool. Yeah, back back at the swimming. Oh, that's right. I probably. I can actually get on. Uh, yeah, yeah. This might be, be this might be a goat worthy stairs. attempt. Yeah. These b bores are so improbably wide; it makes my hips hurt just to watch this. I, yeah, no, it's it's a painful angle back here. It really is. Ah, oh, you got to do some yoga stretches before you get on there. Yeah, exactly. You can't just jump onto that. Um, yeah. Okay. Oh, so hammy. yeah. Argent, Argent paintbrush. We're in the, um, uh, we're in on the threshold at the threshold. Mm -hmm. Yep. Now the pools near the that we just went past are rather on the shallow side. Yes. Okay. So the question that we were ending with last time was, mm -hmm. what was the point of these? 
like what were the what can we des- what can we um, ascertain of the reason for these rooms originally? Mm-hmm. Um, do you think this is a quenching pool? Um, it I could- think it's more like a like a like a like a hot spring or jacuzzi, honestly. So it does seem would to a- have like steps yeah. leading down into it here. Yeah, I mean, I, you and I both missed this last time, and there were people dancing in here that we couldn't see. Yeah, we were standing right out there, the and you side. can't see it at all. I mean, there is like a, a whole privacy wall here. Yes, thank you for the demonstration, Bailin, though. <laughs> yes. If I were to stand out here, I could not see her at all. And it is certainly true that... Um, it's certainly true, on the one hand, that the forges of Moria are of a very significant um, scale, mm-hmm. right? I mean, this is a huge forge here. Like, an yeah. improbably, really an impossibly impractical-sized forge. I mean, it's... Uh, yeah, okay. it's so too like impress. It, that is too impress. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like... Seriously, like what kind of metal are you going to thrust into this in order to like, what are you going to heat a 10, you know, like a 20 foot pole all at the same time? Um, yeah, you get all sorts of uneven temperatures in there. Yeah, I mean, maybe I guess if you're a whole bunch of dwarves, bah, who knows? Like, I'm not a maybe, dwarf but Moria. also consider how prickly and dry this room must be a bit like a sauna. And then um, like maybe there's some sort of output into the water is a good, like, you know, we got all this nice hot water. Why let it go to waste? Maybe. Yeah. It certainly could be a water source though. Again, you'd think there would be access to it. From well, and si- I am also reminded that, uh, Nordic people, whom the dwarves are sort of based on a bit, um, mm-hmm. they are rather recalcitrant to get to know you unless a hot tub or sauna is involved, then they're suddenly <laughs> very sociable. No, right. this is a this is actually a joke I've seen many times. No, like, yeah, this is the no, only time you, you will hear a Finn speak is in a hot tub. <laughs> right, right. I I I can understand that. Um, okay, so so let's let's see this. If this is some kind of luxury thing. Like if this mm-hmm. is actually a swimming pool or hot tub, which mm-hmm. I don't want to work at, which I, I don't want to rule out. I mm-hmm. would think if they would have a hot tub or swimming pool, mm-hmm. um, they, um, there would be some other, wouldn't you think some other sign of like leisure or luxury I mean maybe the giant forges are a Moria style luxury maybe maybe whatever whatever um, systems were in place were made out of wood or something organic that didn't last it's um, possible though that's a little hard to imagine from a Moria well, perspective it's well possible. yeah I mean it's true. It's nearest the door. This would be the easiest. If you brought brought in wood anywhere, this would be one of the two places you would do it. Right. See, now this I could believe is a jumbo quenching pool. Although, ironically, we can't get into this at all, even though it has almost no wall. Well, and the other thing is maybe it's an emergency measure. If you're working with fire, it's good to have uh, your uh, combination dowser. <laughs> And, and uh, eye wash station. Eye wash station, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's for exactly. lab safety. Yeah, maybe. maybe. That would be my other one. Well, and the other one is this one's shorter, so like maybe one is elf-sized and the other is dwarf-sized, since this is the elf reception hall. It is the elf reception hall. The other one was um, much taller, not dwarf height at all. Yeah, the other one is taller, for sure. Yeah, maybe their vassals are in charge of all that stuff. Maybe. Maybe. Maybe it's assumed any elf would have an entourage that would have would take care of it. So, do we think... All right, so we've got the overlook over here with mm-hmm. uh, some railing, but not difficult to get over. Mm-hmm. Um, 
so that we can look down into the entry hall. Again, I'm, just, I'm, I'm trying to get a whole picture of the overall thing. Like, you're coming... Like, the only way to approach, assuming that the, the road to the other... So at the top of the stairs, right, we had a four-way intersection. And mm -hmm. when we turned left, it just went this way. Like, this is the only thing that the left-hand side was. So assuming that the right-hand side also went over to the gallery over there on the right, and that was all that did. That would mean that to go back out. Gosh, I have to ride my pig again to get out there. Um, <laughs> uh, if we go back to the intersection, mm -hmm. um, yeah, because this is, we, we can see by the walls, there was, there was no other passageway, unless there's a secret passageway, but let's rule that out for now. Um, that would mean that from this intersection, the only way anyone would be coming is 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 this way, mm -hmm. right? So you've got all traffic out of Moria comes here to the top of the stairs. So if you're coming out, if you're on your way to the outside for trade, if you're going, if you're an elf returning home, whatever, right? You're coming out this mm -hmm. way and you're going straight down the stairs, right? And similarly, if you just came in, if you're an elf who came in, you would come up the stairs. Why do we have galleries overlooking the threshold at all? When they don't it's go anywhere. Like it's a parade route. Yeah. It is almost it, it it feels showy in that way, doesn't it? Yeah. Because it feels it's, like it feels like you're the president waving to all the people going down Right? The boulevard yeah. or something. Yeah. I mean Yes. To some yeah, it does keep coming yeah. back to an entourage. This is like the big, you know, this is for show. Yes. So you build this huge inner threshold. Mm -hmm. Welcome to Cavernous Moria. Spectacular glowing crystals, um, carven stones, enormous ceilings. Impossible to um, dust. Yes. Welcome. Uh, welcome to Casa Doom. And then you could have like people blowing trumpets from the galleries. And stuff. But again, there's like stuff to do and stuff. So. Like I'm, the reason I wanted to come back out here is I'm just kind of thinking of the route. Like, in order to use... The galleries aren't on the way to anywhere, right? You have to be yeah, like, no, now I'm going to take a right-hand turn instead and go all the way around to the gallery. Um, and mm -hmm. if I do that, then I'll find a bunch of forges I can use, maybe a hot tub to hang out in. But, like, who does the hanging? Is it... Is it a waiting area for people who are waiting to be joined by people coming in here? Is it, um, is it, again, just where you would wait? Yeah, I, where you'd wait. And then you can look out over the, over the edges to see yeah, yeah. and to welcome people. Because you, one thing that you could easily do if you mm -hmm. are up there in the gallery, then you could easily make it around to here and be at the top of the stairs by the time they got up here. Yeah, and we don't know what's on the other side. There could be kitchens, or it could be, you know, sleeping quarters or something like that. It could just be a place for people to hang out. This is literally a city, so right. it makes sense to have an area near the start where travelers, who presumably have gone a long distance, to just take a break before traveling the rest of the city. Yeah, yeah. Actually, I, I, I hadn't thought about it in those terms. But you're right. We don't know what was over on the other side in the galleries. Mm -hmm. And if there are, it was one of the things that was kind of puzzling me in a way was the absence of any kind of apparent accommodation. The, the sort of utility, I mean, luxurious mm -hmm. utility in a sense, huge forges and big pools, but, um, but nothing in the way of like, this is the dining room and this is the bedroom and stuff like that. Right. Um, but, um, yeah. Anyway, so, so, and yes, we saw stables by the entrance, but, and maybe they would have put stables down there, but I'm not convinced. That's the, yeah. I mean, yeah. Well, I'm also horses in don't the days fare of too the well glory. here. So if they came here on horses, They'd probably have to leave them well, yeah, they, someplace they around here. Bring the horses up the stairs. So yeah, they would have to have. Like, yeah, exactly. Hang on, now I want to go back down here and imagine. You yeah, come yeah, yeah. In, and you've got. 
Yeah, well, you'd have to like jump your horse over this wall to get. I mean, unless well, all they the stables did... are made of wood. Yeah. It wouldn't have lasted all this time. It's possible that there might have been something like over here. Yeah, there's there's these uh, there were these crates are piled up. There could have been some kind of alcove, a bit like a Gondorian stable. Yeah, yeah, or even like the stable in Rivendell. You know, like a uh -huh. little just some stalls against the wall and stuff. Because they we don't even know. If, yeah, I mean, it might be underwater right now. <laughs> right, right, but no, I mean, something would be on this on this level because again, you can't take the horses up the stairs, and the stairs are the are yeah. The no, I meant the. The, the stables for horses might be outside. Right. And right. Oh, wait, hang on. You can long... get over here. You can get over here. There's a path over here from the door. So you take an immediate right. So they could have put the stables up here behind the wall. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Before the rock yeah. slide attacked. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense because the elves would be presumably riding horses when they got here and the horses can't go any further. So that they would have had accommodations for the horses here make sense. So mm -hmm. again, you're up in the gallery, right? Mm -hmm. And you're watching for people to arrive while they get here and their horses, they go and park their horses. I know that's not really the word you use for horses, but anyway, you go and park your horses um, and then they'd come out and you would either have time to get around and await them at the top of the stairs or you could come down the stairs to welcome them if you wanted to. But yes, the idea that between the two galleries there was also hospitality here. So like if they say they arrived and, you know, were weary and needed to rest right away, you have full facilities right, right next. Just, they just have to go up the one set of, it's it yeah, yeah. a long set of stairs. And then you've got the galleries there. Um, yeah, that, that, that works. I think um, thinking of the, the mystery of the second gallery, I think helps. Um, helps me thinking uh thinking about that <laughs> okay yeah, cool. we're gonna see a lot of these galleries off to the side some of them we can explore some of them we can't yeah exactly exactly but no it's it's um seeing what the current dwarves are doing and what the current conditions are is interesting but all the way through that's going to be the like the thing i'm least interested in like we'll see it and we'll observe it but it's it's not the thing that I find think is interesting. The number one thing I want to be seeing everywhere we go in Moria. The question I'm going to be asking again, again and again is, what was going on here? Like at the pinnacle of Moria, you know, at the pinnacle of of, of the life of Khazad Doom, what exactly was happening in this area, and mm -hmm. um, and then where possible, if we're any places where we're able to see or make a guess at like the decline of the um of Moria or like post Balrog um evidence. Yeah, there's a lot of infested places that probably hold a lot of clues. Yeah, exactly. But so don't discount the dwarves. I'm sure them are going to be using places as they were intended. Yeah, it's true that we might get some clues. We might get some clues that way. It's even conceivable that the storage of crates and things like that is one of the things that this place was used for. Um, if this was like a, a depot area for dwarves who were heading out this way in order to go trade with the elves, um, mm -hmm. it is conceivable that there might have been. I do think stabling would be one reason, one function of this room. Um, but it is possible that there might even have been some storage back in the day. Not well, necessarily, yeah, this would, but this would kind of be your outdoor mail room for the this part of Middle Earth, you know. This well, is right, where that's all what I'm kind of saying. I mean, all the stuff goes out. Yeah, w we were joking about this being the mud room, but it is. Um, uh, I mean, it is a very functional sort of entryway, um, and it's very grand. But again, the ceiling is left rough. It's not. This is not just an absolutely, you know, dress to impress kind of room. Well, the that depends the on your... The grandeur of it is significant, but yeah. it's less fancy than it could be. I, I, it, I think that uh, depends on your point of view. I think the mm -hmm. fact that this is a natural arch does hold some... I mean, we have a park in Virginia called Natural Arch. It's 
specifically right. for a thing that looks like this uh, the dwarves might might have left this un, undone just to show off look at this amazing cave structure look at this amazing right. arch it made just for us Right. Yeah. As Emily says, it depends on your aesthetic. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, it's true. I could see an yeah. elf looking up there. Oh, they didn't even finish the season. It's <laughs> right. spackle up there or something. Right. Which is, of course, very unlike the caves of the wood elves or Menegroth. Right. When elves live in caves, oh. they do it differently. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Um, Yep. These rocks look too rocky. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. They, they don't. They they look insufficiently like trees. Yes. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, cool. All right. Excellent. Um, so next time we will continue forward. We shall leave the entry parlor next time and begin to work our way. Uh, out into the great delving here. I'm looking at the map now. Um, mm. Yes, so we will enter into the paths and we will see, I believe, a fairly sharp difference between this opening cave and what comes right beyond it. So, um, yep. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us tonight, and we will see you again as we continue to explore the Great Delving next week. Oh boy. Very good. Thanks, everybody. Bye Night. now.